Welcome to the Election Day Special, Who Cares Who Gets Elected? I'm your host, Casey, and this is the God Word Podcast. I'm sitting here without any notes, trying a different style of an episode, I suppose. Uh, I think this is episode 9, and I'm sort of happy with the first 8, but... um, I don't know. I was looking... I wanted to cover Venerable Beads. Formerly well-known book, The Ecclesiastical History of the English People. It's one that is never taught in America, certainly. Probably little chunks are taught in English schools, I imagine. Um, But as I look at it, it's really hard to summarize the whole thing. I mean, this is very much a history. uh, And so it doesn't really have, like, a plot or, like, main characters. He just covers, you know, about... 400 years of English history here from the time of the first Christian missionaries uh, up through the date that he published it, which is, I think, around, well, published, you know, they didn't have, like, a printing press, finished his manuscript in, like, 732 AD. So, as I thumb through this, I mean, the main thing that strikes me, and this is going to be the title of the episode, is what I call the Enchanted Worldview. And the enchanted worldview is, it's not a naive thing. That is the dominant impression I get from Bede. It's not as if this guy is some sort of country moron. Uh, he, and I'll, I'll tell you why. I mean, he writes, or why I think that, he writes so, like, like at such an elevated style that you can't believe that he doesn't have, like, what Julian Jaynes would have called interiority or consciousness, Right? Like, this is not some um, sort of zombie person who has yet to have any contact with the Logos and and sort of just, like, it's, okay, so for instance, for example, in his description of King Edwin, who is one of the earliest converts to Christianity, like, Edwin is described as a extremely uh, reflective, self-aware sort of a person, meditative even. And so when he first hears about, you know, the the uh, the good news, the gospel, he is not immediately won over to it. This is the kind of thing that requires, you know, again, like prayerfulness. And this is the kind of conversion that's described with Edwin. And Bede's description of him, I think, gives me a sense that Bede also had considered these things. And so when you see some of the enchantments that I'm going to talk about here, some of the miracles, effectively, I think you have to understand that, like, these are not, you know, again, these are not like morons just believing some game of telephone. These are people who knew how the universe worked, roughly. I mean, they knew that these things kind of were extraordinary. They they knew that this was like an unusual period in history, and yet the descriptions of these miracles appears in the midst of what otherwise would be basically like, you know, a Thucydides-like historical narrative. Here's some of the description of uh, uh, King Edwin. Um, Let's see. uh, The holy night of Easter day. By the way, Easter was the big holiday for these early Christians, for sure. Way bigger than Christmas. And it was very important to them that they got the date right. Uh, I think it had to do something with, you know, not being quite the same Sunday as Passover or something, but it had to be one moon off or like whatever. But they, they argued about it and it was a big deal to them to all make sure that the whole, like basically all of Christendom was celebrating Easter on the same day. So this says, on the same night, the holy night of Easter day, the queen had borne the king a daughter named Enfell, Enfled, Enfled. This book, by the way, is full of great old English names for your children. Uh, <clears throat> the king, in the presence of Bishop Paulinus, gave thanks to his gods for the birth of his daughter. But the bishop, on the other hand, began to thank the Lord Christ and tell the king that it was in answer to his prayers to God that the queen had been safely delivered of a child and without great pain. The king was delighted with his words and promised that if God would grant him life and victory over the king who had sent the assassin who wounded him, he would renounce his idols and serve Christ. And as a pledge that he would keep his word, he gave his infant daughter to Bishop Paulinus to be consecrated to Christ. She was baptized on the holy day of Pentecost, the first of the Northumbrian race to be baptized, 
together with eleven others of his household. When in due course the king had been healed of his wound, he summoned his army and marched against the West Saxons. During the course of the campaign, he either slew all whom he discovered to have plotted his death or forced them to surrender. So he returned victorious to his own country. But he was unwilling to accept the mysteries of the Christian faith at once and without consideration, even though he no longer worshipped idols after he had promised that he would serve Christ. But he first made it his business, as opportunity occurred, to learn the faith systematically from the venerable Bishop Paulinus, and then to consult with the counselors whom he considered the wisest as to what they uh, thought he ought to do. He himself, being a man of great natural sagacity, would often sit alone for long periods in silence, but in his innermost thoughts he was deliberating with himself as to what he ought to do and which religion he should adhere to. And then follows this long exchange of a couple of letters with Pope Boniface trying to convince him to become a Christian. Uh, A few chapters later, he has this middle-of-the-night vision where a stranger shows up and basically tells him to become, you know, a Christian. I mean, it's a very, it's a strange thing. It's a very strange thing. So this is the, this is the enchanted worldview. And it's, you can see Edwin, like, struggling with the difficulty of kind of converting his own mind to this worldview, where extraordinary things happen. I was listening yesterday trying to think of a way, I, by the way, I, I don't have any audio clips for you in this episode because I couldn't find any good ones. There's not stuff that I think is interesting enough on the question of the enchanted worldview. I I was searching for things like, you know, miracles. There's what, for instance, there's one interesting essay by David Hume called Of Miracles in his essay on, or essay concerning human understanding. I think it's chapter 10, actually. And he talks about how, like, miracles... uh, essentially like we are predisposed to not accept that miracles exist like we we have too much experience in the world for to just easily accept the reality of miracles and so we're like even if we hear a neighbor whom we've lived next to for 10 years describe some miracle that happened all of a sudden we're going to look for some alternative explanation either they've lost their minds or some con man tricked them or it was an illusion, or, you know, uh, just an extreme coincidence, or whatever. But, like, a miracle, we just tend not to believe it. And so you can see these early English kings and converts and confessors sort of, I mean, they are very aware that they're trading in, the like, the natural worldview for the enchanted worldview. And uh, and yet they do it. And so same same goes for Bede, who... Clearly is a genius. I mean, this guy's a big-brained, really eloquent writer. He gives you all this, just such a well-organized history of England. But then, you know, now and then, he just throws in these descriptions of miracles, and he reports them in the exact same voice with a certain degree of astonishment, but not like, uh, you know, not as if... It's, it's not, it doesn't sound mythic. That's what's so fun about reading Bede. I mean, this stuff just appears in there. Um, You know, literally like resurrections and uh, healings and people who... Like like one of the the great stories in here is about this King Oswald who... um, uh, Let me... Here, I'll tell you just... I think I can give you this in one paragraph or so. It says... uh, Yeah, Bede says, it is not irrelevant to narrate one of the many miracles which have taken place at the cross. This is the cross where King Oswald was killed. Quote, one of the brothers of the church of Hexham, who is still living, named Botholem, a few years ago was walking incautiously on the ice by night when he suddenly fell and broke his arm. He suffered such anguish from the fractured limb that he could not raise his hand to his mouth because of the pain. Hearing one morning that one of the brothers was proposing to go up to the site of the Holy Cross, he asked him to bring him back some part of the revered wood, saying he believed that the Lord would grant him healing by its means. The brother did as he was asked, returning that evening when all the others were seated at the table. 
He gave the sick man some of the ancient moss with which the surface of the wood was covered. Botham was sitting at the table, and as he had nowhere at hand to keep the proffered gift in safety, he placed it in his bosom. When he went to bed, he forgot to take it out and allowed it to remain where it was. At midnight, he awoke feeling something cold close to his side, and, putting his hand down to find out what it was, he discovered that his arm and hand were as sound as if they had never pained him. End quote. And that's it. I mean, isn't that, isn't that amazing? So part of what this does is it, it sort of makes you wonder, like, I mean, what's going on in this book? Like, how can this stuff be happening and be narrated in, sort of, again, the same tone, the same voice as, you know, essentially like political uh, history? As, like, such as this, for instance... Uh, at the beginning of chapter 8 of book 3, it says, <clears throat> In the year of our Lord 640, Edbald, king of Kent, departed this life and left the government of his kingdom to his son, <clears throat> Eorsen Bert, who ruled with distinction for 24 years and some months. He was the first English king to order idols to be abandoned and destroyed throughout the whole kingdom. He also ordered the 40 days fast of Lent to be observed by royal authority. And so that his commands might not be too lightly neglected, he prescribed suitably heavy punishments for offenders. Isn't, I mean, so that's like, there's no miracles there. This is just describing the reign of some king. By the way, isn't it fun to imagine, I mean... It's the kind of thing where it's like, I think I posted this quote on Instagram yesterday and said something like, you know, okay, yeah, of course, this sort of thing where like a king is forcing his court to observe Lent, this sort of offends even modern Christian sensibilities because it's like, well, what about m my freedom of religion or whatever, you know? But you have to, like, once you start to understand, it's like, and I think the, I mean, I don't know, I don't think listening to my podcast is going to do it. But if you spend the time to read the 400 pages that, you know, that is this book, you start to take on this worldview. And once you've got it, it's like, yeah, well, guess what? I suppose, you know, modern sensibilities would probably have offended or, or uh, freaked out Bede. So it's like what you have then are these two completely competing worldviews. And I, I, I guess I'm kind of thinking... I wouldn't, I don't know. I guess I'm thinking it would be kind of nice to try a day or two in this enchanted world where, you know, a, a, a bit of moss from an ancient cross could heal me of a broken arm. Like, wouldn't that be an interesting universe? It's like a different video game or something. Like, let's try the whole other universe where strange, bizarre things happen. Um, so anyway, Oswald was very famous for like having healing powers, even after he died. Um, I'll give you one more, just since, I don't know, I think these are fun to read. It says, uh, <clears throat> let's see, uh, the, he's talking to some guy, I think it's Bishop Wilfred or something, and said he also related how when he was still only a priest and living a pilgrim's life in Ireland out of love for his eternal fatherland, the fame of Oswald's sanctity had spread far and wide in that island too. One of these miracles which he told I have thought worth including in the present history. And so then he like quotes it. He says, uh, At the time of the plague, which caused widespread havoc both in Britain and Ireland, one of the many victims was a certain Irish scholar, a man learned in literary studies but utterly careless and unconcerned about his own everlasting salvation. When he realized that he was near death, he trembled to think that as soon as he was dead, he would be snatched away to the bondage of hell because of his sins. As I happened to be nearby, he sent for me and, trembling and sighing in his weakness, tearfully told me his troubles. You see, he said, that I am getting worse and have now reached the point of death, nor do I doubt that after the death of my body, my soul will immediately be snatched to everlasting death to suffer the torments of hell. For in spite of all 
my study of the scriptures, it has long been my custom to entangle myself in vice rather than obey God's commands. But I have made up my mind, if by the grace of heaven I am granted any further term of life, to correct my vicious ways and to devote my whole heart and life to obeying the divine will. I know indeed that it will not be through any merits of my own that I shall receive a new lease on life, nor can I hope to receive it unless perhaps God should deign to grant me forgiveness, wretched and unworthy though I am. The inter, uh, though the inter, th- sorry, through the intercession of those who have served him faithfully. Now we have heard a widespread report about an extremely holy king of your race named Oswald, and how since his death the occurrence of frequent miracles has borne witness to his outstanding faith and virtue. So I beg you, if you have any more of his relics with you, to bring them to me, so that the Lord may perhaps have mercy upon me through his merits." And uh, the bishop guy answers, I have some of the wooden stake on which his head was fixed by the heathen after he was killed. If you firmly believe with all your heart, God in his grace can grant you a longer term of earthly life through the merits of this man and also fit you to enter the eternal life. He at once answered that he had complete faith in it. Then I blessed some water, put a splinter of the oak into it and gave it to the sick man to drink. He immediately felt better, recovered from his sickness, and lived for many years. He turned to the Lord in heart and deed, and wherever he went, proclaimed the goodness of the merciful creator and the glory of his faithful servant. And so, I mean, I don't know, you guys, like, doesn't that sound, I mean, I know what it sounds like to you, because I live in the same desacralized world that you have lived in. Uh, where just this sort of thing is supposed to not happen. We, we just generally don't believe in miraculous healings, but it's like, that's, that's the promise of the book of Acts. You know, these are the fruits of the spirit. I mean, and it seems that it was happening in England in the seventh century, all the way up through the eighth century. I mean, certainly all the way up through the, the, you know, I mean, he's reporting miracles right up to the last page of this book. There's a great story about a guy named Fursa. Um, he was also suffering from an illness, and then he had some vision, and uh, you know he continued to watch and pray and not be weary, and studied the sacred books and stuff, and uh, and then he, I believe he dies. Yeah, it says he dies. He was snatched from the body. He quitted it from evening to cock crow. During that time, he was privileged to gaze upon the angelic hosts and to listen to their blessed songs of praise. Um, And then in the morning, it says, he returned to his body, and two days afterwards was taken out of it a second time, and saw not only very great joys of the blessed, but also the fierce onslaughts of the evil spirits, who by their manifold accusations wickedly sought to prevent his journey to heaven. But they failed utterly, for he was protected by angels. And then Bede says, if anyone wishes to know more of these matters, let him read the book I have mentioned, and I think he will gain great spiritual benefit from it. There he will learn with what subtlety and deceit the devils reported Fursa's deeds, his idle words, and his very thoughts, just as if they had written them down in a book, and the joyful and sad things that he learned from both the angels and from the righteous men who appeared to him in the company of the angels." But there is one of these incidents which, oh, sorry. So then he goes on to say, uh, let's see. Yeah, so then it says, in another like in another vision or something, it says, Fursa had been taken up to a great height. He was told by the angels who were conducting him to look back at the world. As he looked down, he saw some kind of dark valley immediately beneath him and four fires in the air, not very far from one another. And when he asked the angels what these fires were, <clears throat> excuse me, he was told that they were the fires which were to kindle and consume the world. One of them is falsehood. The second is covetousness. The third is discord. The fourth is injustice. And so on. Um, and uh, he, says, the, he says to the angel, Look, sir, the fire is coming near me. But the angel answered, That which you did not kindle will not burn you. For although the conflagration seems great and terrible, it tests each man according to his deserts. 
and the evil desires of everyone will be burned away in this fire. I mean, like what? And it says when he finally woke up, when Fursa had been restored to his body, he bore for the rest of his life the marks of the burns which he had suffered while a disembodied spirit. They were visible to all on his shoulder and his jaw. It is marvelous to think that what he suffered secretly as a disembodied spirit showed openly upon his flesh. I mean, yeah, like, what? It is marvelous, right? Like, what the heck? But Bede tells us this is what's happening. And people saw these things. Like, you know, this was not like... I mean, I don't know. I just find it to be completely interesting. In some ways, you know, I've been, like, we've been dealing with uh, Plato and with, like, the early Greek gods and the, the uh, like, the shamanic rituals of the pre-Socratics at the mystery rites. Let me take a drink here. And, you know, and I'm kind of looking at, like, early, early Greece admiringly for the same thing. They seem to have this, this uh, enchanted worldview where, you know, <clears throat> again, like strange things are supposed to happen. And then by the time, like, you know, the first century in Rome comes around, it seems it's all just politics. It's a very disenchanted uh, world. But it seems that Christianity re-enchanted the world, at least for a while. And you got these kind of crazy, like, you know, Egyptian-style miracles happening in England in the 6th and 7th century. And I'm saying, like, I don't know the way back exactly, but like I kind of would love to try it, um, or or at least to like, I don't know, hear about some of this stuff. <clears throat> There's uh there was a really interesting, you know, th- like again, it's not all miracles. There's like, for instance, there's the reports about a big uh, di- dispute regarding Easter. As I said, Easter was the big, more important holiday. Uh, and, you know, celebrated in Italy and Gaul and Greece and Egypt and Asia and Africa, and they want it to be at the same time. Um, let me see. Wilfred here is making the case... Or wait, is this... There's this guy, Coleman, is arguing with Wilfred. And uh, let's see. Wilfred replied, Far be it from me to charge John with foolishness. He literally observed the decree or the decrees of the Mosaic law when the church was still Jewish in many respects, at a time when the apostles were unable to bring to a sudden end the entire observance of that law, which God ordained in the same way as, for instance, they made it compulsory on all new converts to abandon their idols, which are of devilish origin. They feared, of course, that they might make a stumbling block for the Jewish proselytes dispersed among the Gentiles. This was the reason why Paul circumcised Timothy, why he offered sacrifices in the temple, and why he shaved his head at Corinth in, the company, er, in company with Aquila and Priscilla. All this was of no use except to avoid scandalizing the Jews. Hence James said to Paul, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of them which have, been, which have believed, and they are all zealous for the law. But in those days, when the light of the gospel is spreading throughout the world, it is not necessary. It is not even lawful for believers to be circumcised or to offer God sacrifices of flesh and blood. So John, in accordance with the custom of the law, began the celebration of Easter Day in the evening of the 14th day of the first month, regardless of whether it fell on the Sabbath or any other day. But when Peter preached at Rome, remembering that the Lord rose from the dead and brought to the world the hope of the resurrection on the first day of the week, he realized that Easter ought to be kept as follows. He always waited for the rising of the moon on the evening of the 14th day of the first month in accordance with the custom, the precepts of the law, just as John did. But when it had risen, if the Lord's day, which was then called the first day of the week, followed in the morning, he proceeded to celebrate Easter as we are accustomed to do at the present time. Blah, blah, blah. So it came about that Easter Sunday was kept only between the 15th day of the moon and the 21st. So this evangelical and apostolic tradition does not abolish the law, but rather fulfills it, and so on. I guess I just think this is all really interesting because it gives you a sense of how hard it is to keep, well, the church 
unified, right? Or, or I mean, it's, so this is like, and I think actually, I think the, uh, how did it go? I think that like the Irish church sided with the Eastern Orthodox for a while against Rome here or something. <clears throat> anyway, then he talks about, for example, like, you know, uh, there's a lot of plague, there's eclipses, there's those sorts of things like that's again part of the enchanted worldview like when i remember when the uh eclipse cut across america a couple of years ago you know people went out to see it but no one really thought it portended any like uh like you know metaphysical meaning anymore but it did i mean it certainly did um back in Bede's day it, it, it maybe it meant that people were sinning too much or something, and you know I don't know. Like like I said, I guess I guess we can predict when the eclipses are coming, and I guess they aren't related to our own behavior and all that stuff. But you know, part of like part of all this for me is sort of thinking out loud to try to explore whether like you know with Socrates, like I don't know the answer. But like, is could there be another way of living in the world? And I think Bede shows us one possibility here. Um, I'll just read another little chunk here. Talks about a guy named Chad. Chad died on 2nd March and was first of all buried close to the Church of St. Mary. But when the Church of St. Peter, the most blessed chief of the apostles, was later built, his bones were translated there. In each place, frequent miracles of healing occur as a sign of his virtue. For example, quite recently, a madman, who had been wandering from one place to another, came there one evening, unknown to or unregarded by the guardians of the church, and spent the whole night there. The next morning, he came out in his right mind, and to the amazement and joy of all, demonstrated how he had regained his health there through the goodness of God. Chad's place of burial is a wooden coffin in the shape of a little house having an aperture in its side through which those who visit it out of devotion can insert their hands and take out a little of the dust. When the dust is put in water and given either to cattle or men who are ailing, they get their wish and are at once freed from their ailments and rejoice in health restored. <laughs> kind of amazing. I mean, also, like, probably difficult for some of you Protestants. I remember the time I went to uh, Italy most recently. I, it was at the Medici Chapel, I think, that downstairs they have a bunch of relics, you know, including, like, like the finger bone of, uh, like, St. Julian of Norwich. Well, or that no, wouldn't be who. Whatever, one of the saints... And uh, I think like a piece of Mary's shawl or something. And these are in these little glass containers inside a glass display and, you know, very carefully preserved. And, you know, there's a part of me that's like, okay, I don't know. Like maybe I side with John Calvin here a little bit. And it's not that I want to destroy them, but I mean, come on. Is this thing really healing anyone anymore? But then again, you read Bede and it's like, this is, this is, these are immediate testimonies that like just over and over again describe people healed, saved, you know, um, even brought back to life at times because of this, these kinds of things. And I don't know, I, I like the idea of that. Maybe it would be fun to try to live in a world where that sort of thing happened. Uh, <clears throat> there's the story of Ethelbruh. Ethel, Ethelbra, a devout mother of the devoted community. So here we've got like a, you know, a monastery for nuns. Um, it says, <clears throat> She was always seeking to serve God in all her humility and sincerity and endeavoring to help the mother to keep the discipline of the rule by teaching or reproving the younger ones. Now in order that her strength, like the apostles, might be made perfect in weakness, she was suddenly afflicted with a most serious bodily disease for nine years, was sorely tried under the good providence of our Redeemer, so that any traces of sin remaining among her virtues through her ignorance or carelessness might be burnt away by the fires of prolonged suffering. And you hear what, like, that's bead. Yes, like, strapping a meaning onto what would be perceived in the modern era as just, you know, 
a, like a crappy skin disease that lasts forever. It's just an annoying illness and you need to take some medicine to fix it. But what Bede says over and over again is that like, no, this is burning away the sin that was in her to make her perfect. <clears throat> Quoting again, one evening at dusk, as she left the little cell in which she lived, she saw distinctly what seemed to be a human body wrapped in a shroud and brighter than the sun, being apparently raised up from within the house in which the sisters used to sleep. She looked closely to see how this glorious visionary body was raised up and saw that it was lifted, as it were, by cords, brighter than gold, until it was drawn up into the open heavens and she could see it no longer." <laughs> Uh, blah, 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 skipping a little bit. Uh, for many years, her whole body had been so disabled that she could not move a single limb. <clears throat> At last, when the time of her release approached, she lost the use not only of her limbs, but also of her tongue. She continued in this state for three days and nights when she was suddenly restored by a spiritual vision and her eyes and mouth were open. Looking up to heaven, she began to speak to the vision she beheld. Your coming, she said, is most acceptable to me, and you are indeed welcome. When she had said this, she was silent for a short time, as if she were waiting for an answer from the one whom she saw and was addressing. Again, she added, as if slightly displeased, I cannot be happy to hear this. And then, after a short silence, she said for a third time, If it cannot be today... I beg that there may not be a long delay. After this was again a short silence as before, and then she uttered these final words. If this is definitely fixed and the decree is unalterable, then I pray that it may not be put off beyond the following night. When she finished speaking, those who were sitting around asked her with whom she had been talking. She answered, With my beloved mother, Ethelbreth. Thus they realized that Ethelbra had come <clears throat> to announce to her that the time of her departure was near. As she requested, after a night and a day, she was loosed from the bonds of the flesh and her infirmities and entered upon the joys of eternal salvation. So she died, just sort of just as she predicted. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Like, what do you guys think about this? Do we have... Uh, is there any hope of going back to it? I was also listening to some speeches uh, about um, one of the weirdest, kind of most interesting books I ever read by Julian Jaynes, the book called, uh, you know, what's it called? The Origin of Consciousness and the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind. Because I was thinking like, you know, because his claim is that basically like what we consider to be consciousness, first of all, nobody takes it uh, seriously enough, or nobody like appreciates the mystery of it. We generally think that it's some kind of like vague cognitive process that kind of accompanies, you know, getting along in the world. And so we assume that basically like, you know, our pets have consciousness just as we do, maybe le a little less of it or something, but no, like consciousness is essentially singular in humans. It's the, it's the interiority that we're talking about here like the it's you know it's not just being reactive to uh the environment but like like you know it's it's observed i mean you can do I, I can't remember how they did this but starting in the 19th century they started to figure out that there are that, that like your conscious mind is not always a product of your environment like sometimes you're thinking of things that aren't present. And so it starts to beg the question of like, what is going on here? What is consciousness? If you can, you know, be sitting in <clears throat> prison, but I don't know, thinking of the like, you know, love of for your children or something like that. Like these are, there's a disconnect between them. And so it, and we don't think that that happens so much with the animals. And so this, in Julian Jane's argument, this, arises first as a, he basically says as like, it begins as auditory hallucinations, which were brought on by extreme moments of stress. So you can think, he actually locates the transition between the Iliad and the Odyssey, where like in the Iliad, basically the characters do whatever the gods tell them to do. They're, they're essentially zombies, you know, they just are sort of uh, like they're on like an almost autopilot or like a, they react to what, like something beyond themselves. But in the Odyssey, 
you see Odysseus becomes ruminative and he's he's very you know wily and reflective and he starts to think about things and he becomes you know the master of his own domain basically and i guess like i mean it is mysterious right this is the idea would be that somehow like in the early days what people these auditory hallucinations they they took to be the voice of a god let's say or a dead king and so if if all of a sudden you're I don't know, you're out hunting for, um, like, you know, elk or whatever, and you hear this voice say, behind you, you know, and and then you turn around and there's an elk. Well, initially you attribute that, again, auditory hallucination to being like 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 a revelation, the voice of some god. And so you're in a very enchanted world. Like everything is enchanted in that world. But the transition to the modern world and the disenchanted world, the world we now are all sort of li- stuck in, it seems, is where in, like that, somehow that voice becomes your own inner monologue. And now it's like, it's not, it's like instead of, being an edict from a god that just reveals to you that you should turn around, it now comes out slightly differently as like, maybe I should look behind me. And so you think of it as your own, your own voice. Like that's, this is me. This is, this, that's my consciousness, right? But now the world is kind of less enchanted because you're not receiving, you know, instructions about how to navigate it from without, but rather you think that you're reacting to the environment. It's something like that. And it seems it seems these early Christians in some cases were living more in accordance with like the spirit. They were kind of living, there were like revelations. Things were happening that came to them from outside in ways that I, it just doesn't seem like have happened much to the people I've known in my lifetime. The central thesis of David Hume's work of miracles is that testimony is never sufficiently convincing evidence of the occurrence of a miracle. Why should we believe that something that consistently seems to be impossible occurred just because someone or even many people say it happened? The rarer an event appears to be, the more and stronger evidence one is justified in requesting in order to be convinced. Okay, let me see if I can find anything else I wanted to read to you from this. There are, <clears throat> let me actually look at some notes here, I guess. Yeah, as I said, Easter was definitely the major holiday. Conversion from hearing the gospel often came very quickly. Uh, there was, there, there, by the way, interestingly, there is no mention of confession as a prerequisite for the Eucharist. And there is also a scene where one of the uh, participants takes the Eucharist in his hands which, you know, I just, I just note that to freak out my traditionalist Catholic friends a little bit. Um, let's see, Edwin, yeah, there's first, uh, oh, there's a scene where, uh, you know, the, this is one of those never forget the, the uh, horrors that happened. <clears throat> if you're an English person, here's one of those scenes that gives you a little bit of street cred, since all the time we are hearing about the suffering of people and that we have to take care of them from now on because of some historical tragedy. But when St. Gregory went to Rome, he encountered for the first time some of these uh, English. And I, I think this is an interesting little paragraph. It says, Bede says, we must not fail to relate the story about St. Gregory, which has come down to us as a tradition of our forefathers. It explains the sal- or sorry, it explains the reason why he showed such earnest solicitude for the salvation of our race. It is said that one day, soon after some merchants had arrived in Rome, a quantity of merchandise was exposed for sale in the marketplace. Crowds came to buy, and Gregory too amongst them. As well as other merchandise, <clears throat> he saw some boys put up for sale with fair complexions, handsome faces, and lovely hair. On seeing them, he asked, so it is said, from what region or land they had been brought. He was told that they came from the island of Britain, whose inhabitants were like that in appearance. He asked again whether those islanders were Christians or still entangled in the errors of heathenism. He was told that they were heathen. 
Then, with a deep-drawn sigh, he said, Alas, that the author of darkness should have men so bright of face in his grip, and that minds devoid of inward grace should bear so graceful an outward form. Again, he asked for the name of the race. He was told that they were called Angli. Good, he said, for they have the face of angels, and such men should be fellow heirs of angels in heaven. So this is uh, <clears throat> this is how it goes um, in bead. It's I think if you're if you have English ancestry, this should be required reading. Um, if you're a Christian, it's darn near required reading. And if you have any interest in miracles, this is this is the book for you. Yeah, I think I think often about um, like. Like I remember reading how in the in the German higher criticism there was a lot of conversation about whether miracles you know in the gospels are meant to convince us like is that why we should believe what Jesus says in the sermon on the mount or should we just believe it as intrinsically convincing you know and <clears throat> I mean, I don't know, like, it, it's still, it's second and third hand, right? Like, okay, yeah, I guess if I personally saw a guy walk on water, to be honest, I would be like, well, he's probably not walking on water, you know? It's just, like, in other words, you would just always be, because you're a modern, you're always looking for, an a, like, a natural explanation. But it seems like these people who had real faith, I don't know, they were just able to see miracles happening. And I'm sort of saying, like, in order to do that, you might have to risk, I don't know, being made a fool of? Maybe that's part of this, right? Is that you, you have to believe. And to believe, you have to put aside some of your skepticism and your, you know, science-worshipping epistemology. And that means that if someone says God spoke to them, you know, rather than recommend that they go see a therapist... You ask, what did he say? And, you know, and then just believe. And it seems like that's the way that these people thought. Ultimately, like, I mean, we'll do William James in a few episodes and talk about the varieties of religious experience. I mean, <clears throat> ultimately, we live in a world where authority is authority and it's hard to negotiate with it. But the, the ultimate trump card does seem to remain mystical experience. I mean, what are you going to do if someone says God spoke to them. Like, you might not believe it. Their revelation doesn't have to be authoritative for you. But if they believe it, you can't really stop them, right? I am looking at my list of what we should do next. Um, I don't know. I've got like Dante, the Gospel of John, and the Bhagavad Gita up next. I think actually what I'll do is the Bhagavad Gita next because it's an ancient text and it describes an enchanted world and we should sort of stay in the ancient world, I guess, first before starting to move forward into history, before we get to, like, Dante. So let's let's do the Bhagavad Gita next week or so. Um, and if you haven't read it, it's only 18 short chapters. It's certainly available online. It's one of the most amazing texts. It's said to be Aryan in origin in the sense that like the Brahmins in India were, I don't know, came from somewhere. You can read about that. I don't really know about it. But anyway, it's such a good story. Arjuna is going to see God in the shape of Krishna. And uh, it's a real mind blower. So prepare for that next time. Hey guys, here's the outro music that we all love so much. <laughs>